Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. One day, historians will write about a time when our country was under an assault on democracy and autocratic leaders condemned and attempted to censor the news media. They'll chronicle the calls to lock up political opponents and how far-right neo-fascist organizations took to the streets and promoted political violence. Immigrants were targeted for deportation and white nationalism was encouraged. Am I talking about the time of Trump? Nope. It was a hundred years earlier and our guest today wrote a book about it. Let's discuss. Well, warm greetings. Uh, welcome to our podcast, Adam Hawkshield, and we are quite looking forward to this this podcast. Greg and I have enjoyed your book greatly, and uh, and a, a little bit of background about you. You have written eleven books. You're quite a prolific historian. I I didn't realize you were an old uh, NPR reporter in San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't actually a reporter, but back in the days when the NPR shows like Morning Edition and All Things Considered had commentators, I was a commentator on All Things Considered for a while, where you've got two minutes to sound off about something. Okay. And uh, co-editor uh, of Mother Mother Jones Magazine, which is, I've been reading that for forever and never kind of put your name together with that. So your your recent book, American Midnight just absolutely blew me away. And it's uh, American Midnight, The Great War, A Violent Peace and Democracy's Forgotten Crisis. And it's a, a period of just a couple of years, 100 years ago, uh, that looks a little bit like what we are going through right now. Tell us about your book. Well, that's right, Pat. It does look a little bit like what we've been through in the last few years. I think of this time, 1917 to 1921, as the Trumpiest time of American history before Trump. It was filled with rage against immigrants and refugees. It was filled with uh, rage at the media, which actually went much farther than Trump was able to do because the uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson administration, in effect, shut down 75 newspapers and magazines that it had deemed too critical. Um, and it was filled with rage at dissidents. And one of the things that happened during this period was it was really a... a a loss of civil liberties that I think is unparalleled in this country since the end of slavery. During those four years, 1917 to 21, roughly a thousand Americans spent a year or more in prison and a much larger number, shorter periods of time, solely for things that they wrote or said. So this was a very violent, repressive time. It was also a time when there was vigilante violence on a huge scale, sanctioned by the federal government. You know, you you mentioned in your in in one of your lectures I saw on um, YouTube that you know when we think of World War One, we think of uh, you know entering the war. The Germans were shooting down our uh, uh, our our boats with their submarines. Uh, we rallied, went to war, won. Uh, it was a success, and then the Roaring Twenties, and then Babe Ruth. And we, we and there, and what I like so much about your book is you take this four years and dive into it and realize what a horrific part of history this was that we don't really know about and i knew a little bit about it but i that's why i was i was just ashamed that i didn't realize how bad it was and, and on many many fronts um and and you mentioned the you know labor immigrants and blacks but go through a little overview of of that yeah well i think the 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 myth that we were taught in our high school history textbooks, and all countries mythologized their history, and the United States is no exception. The myth was that 
In 1917, the United States was a peaceful country. The nations of the old world, these benighted countries in Europe, were tearing each other apart, killing millions of each other's soldiers and so on. Meanwhile, the United States was a very peaceful country. And against our will, we got drawn into this terrible war. But in fact, we were not a peaceful country at all. There were several big conflicts going on. One was between business and labor. And this was an era where that conflict, which of course still goes on today, was extremely violent. Dozens of people were killed in labor violence each year. Just in 1913, 1914 alone, more than 70 people, some of them women and children, were killed by company detectives and National Guardsmen in suppressing a miners' strike in Colorado. So there was that conflict. There was also the conflict between nativists and immigrants, which sometimes turned violent, uh, because throughout American history, the people whose ancestors got here a couple of generations ago have been angry at those who are coming more recently. Today, it's reflected in hostility towards people from Latin America trying to come over the southern border. A hundred years ago, the majority of the white population of the United States was from, you know, their ancestors came from Northwestern Europe, uh, England, Holland, Germany, and so forth. And they were deeply upset that uh, large numbers of in immigrants were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, which meant, you know, Italians, Poles, and Jews. And there was tremendously strong feeling against that. So that was a second conflict. And then the third conflict, which is one that's still with us, is was between black and white Americans, where most black Americans were working in miserable, low paying jobs like picking cotton as sharecroppers. And most white Americans wanted them to stay there. Uh, but blacks were leaving the South. The Great Migration had begun. They were trying to get out of an area where there was often uh, as much as one lynching every week. Oh they my God flooding into northern cities where they often found themselves very uh, unwelcome. And there was huge racial violence as a result. The summer of 1919, there were probably more Black Americans killed than at any point since the um, immediate aftermath of slavery. And when the U.S. entered the First World War, with these conflicts simmering, entering the war was like pouring gasoline on three sets of flames because it meant that that worker who was be on strike could be accused of impeding the war effort. It meant that that person speaking an incomprehensible language on a street corner might be a German spy. Or after November of 1917, when the Russian Revolution broke out, he might be a Russian spy. So those two events, the First World War and the Russian Revolution, you know, further uh, inflamed these three conflicts that were all go already going on. And and you mentioned just the frenzy that occurred when there was a decision to go to war. And I guess we saw a little bit of that with the Gulf War crisis, you know, where we, we just became uh, irrationally exuberant about uh, uh, you know, bombing I Iraq and, and, and going to war. It it was just remarkable. You you know, uh, people, senators, and and chief justices crying in Congress, so excited about wanting to go to war. Uh, Boy Scouts running through the streets of New York. Uh, just it it, it was. Um, I, I, I frenzy isn't the right word. It it was it it's it's a unique phenomenon. Have you seen this before in different? different times? Well, I think we see it often when countries go to war. Uh, if you look at uh, photographs from Europe uh, for when the First World War had begun, you know, three years earlier than this moment we're talking about here, you see photographs of uh, jubilant German troops getting onto a train and it's written on the side to Paris. You see photographs of French troops getting on a train, waving and cheering, and on the side of their train, it's written to Berlin. So countries in beginning a war always think that they're going to do very well and win a swift victory. I mean, look at what 
Putin's attempt to conquer Ukraine. They thought that would be over in a few days. Um, and there's often a kind of jubilation that accompanies that. A war just gives an excuse for those emotions to come to the surface. The moment that symbolized it for me, which uh, I described in the first chapter of American Midnight, which is really an extended account of a single day, April 2nd, 1917, the day that President Woodrow Wilson went to Congress and asked it to de declare war. Now, people knew when Wilson asked to speak to a joint session of Congress that he was going to say something about the war that was then tearing the world apart, but they didn't know uh, whether he was maybe going to ask for a limited declaration of war that, you know, authorized the American Navy to sink German submarines, for instance, uh, or whether it would involve even sending troops to Europe. But at the moment that it became clear that he was going to ask Congress to declare an all-out war with conscription to beef up the army enormously, at that moment in his speech, the Chief Justice of the United States, Edward White of Louisiana, deeply reactionary man, Confederate veteran, leapt to his feet to lead the cheering, weeping tears of joy. And I entitled that chapter, Tears of Joy, because there's something so paradoxical about someone crying with joy at the thought that hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of American men are going to go out risking their lives, many of them losing their lives in combat. But there is a hysteria that we often see when countries go to war. The peculiar thing about this moment was that nobody had attacked the United States. It was not like Pearl Harbor. It was not like the September 11th, 2001 attacks. German submarines, it's true, were sinking American freighters, and this had just started to happen, but these freighters were carrying munitions, war supplies, artillery shells, rifles, and so on, to France and Britain, and the Germans had warned that, you know, the parts of the ocean adjacent to France and Britain are a war zone, and if you send ships full of munitions there, they'll be sunk but the Wilson administration decided to do so anyway. Uh, but nonetheless, this, you know, the country greeted with such jubilation, the feeling that we were going to war. I think a lot of Americans and the person who embodies this feeling really is Theodore Roosevelt, who was no longer president, much to his frustration, but eagerly wanted to be, uh, felt that war was good for the soul. War was a test of martial spirit. Uh, and uh, here the United States was missing out on the greatest war the world had ever seen. He was, of course, thrilled by the prospect of going to war and wanted to lead a large force of volunteers to Europe. So, Greg, didn't didn't you have an uncle that was um, uh, beaten up in Colorado in the miners' strike? Was that this miners' strike, or was that a later later period of time? No, I have, I have a I have a. Uh... An uncle who was uh, part of uh, uh, a rebellious miners organization within the uh, United Mine Workers, and actually mm. he was threatened by John L. Lewis and his thugs because he he was uh, uh, more radical. Than yeah, that. yeah. No, I, it's it's interesting. I I, I think uh, what I really admire about the book is it fills a lacuna. It's 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 something that. As you mentioned earlier, Adam, we, we have a picture from our American history classes in high school or even college, which just doesn't capture what you captured so well and how these things come together at a particular time. I would just say that it, it, it's not uncommon in U.S. history. It's it's McCarthyism was essentially that. Uh, sure. Hysteria around Korea was essentially that. When McCarthyism arose, there was really no military threat. There was an imagined military threat. In 1940, there was a repression not dissimilar from what happened in the 1721 era as well. Um, uh, the head of the Communist Party at that time was jailed for 14 months uh, uh, at that time. Uh, I think it's worth uh, looking at how this ugly stream is present in, America, present in American history for a long, long period. In fact, it never goes away. I've 
I've been one of those people, uh, when I look at Trumpism, I don't see it as anything really that exceptional. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that, you know, you didn't fill in very effectively a part that so few people know about, a part of that history. But it's a commonality. And in my, in my opinion, and I'd like to know what you think about it, I certainly, I certainly felt that in your book. Often it's a time when the center, liberals in general, but the center, uh, caves in. Mm -hmm. They they could rescue America from these excesses, but as they did in 1917, uh, as they did in 1940, as they did um, with McCarthyism, as they often do today, they cave in, and they they'd rather side with the the right if push came to shove, than risk siding with the left in many of these instances, but. I'd love to hear your views on that. I mean, just what are the roots of this kind of um, hysteria? Even the Know Nothing Party was like this. I mean, it captures people and sweeps them up into insanity. Yeah. Well, I think you're right about the center caving in or jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was even in some ways a little left, left of center. He was the last president of the progressive era when he was first elected. He was... Um, reasonably progressive on issues like uh, the graduated income tax, child labor laws, uh, at least modest regulation of business and so forth. Um, but he presided over this wave of repression, which began in, in 1917, which I think goes to show that you don't have to have, you know, an orange haired loudmouth to preside over repression. <laughs> Wilson did that, and he was really the most genteel, scholarly, well-spoken, dignified president imaginable. He'd been a university president for a decade, a college professor all his life. He was friends with many writers and artists. But really, this period, uh, his second term, saw the greatest assault on civil liberties in 20th or 21st century uh, uh, America. And I think in a way it was even intensified by his sense of righteousness, the same righteousness that he felt, you know, as a progressive reformer, uh, you know, where he was going to correct injustices in the United States, you know, in the reforms that he did in his first term. Now he was going to correct injustices in the world. And there's a sort of idealistic side to that, that you can't help but uh, respect in a way. Wilson's great cause, of course, that he believed in more than anything else, was the League of Nations. Now, I don't think in actual fact his dream of the League of Nations with the United States as the most influential country within it would have been any better at stopping wars from breaking out than the UN has been since it was founded in 1945. Nonetheless, you know, you can't deny that it's better for countries to sit down around a table and talk than to fight. But Wilson was driven by this dream uh, and he uh, it really shortened his life because when he was in ill health, he embarked on a nationwide speaking tour promoting the League of Nations. This was after the war was over in 1919 and exhausted himself. And on that uh, train journey around the country, after a month of traveling and speaking, he had the first of several near fatal strokes, which really knocked him out of commission for the rest of his presidency. At the same time as he had that idealistic side, he was shamelessly nativist. Uh, he, he believed not only that white people were superior to black people, but that people of Anglo-Saxon stock, stock was a word that was used a lot in those days, Anglo-Saxon stock were the real Americans and everybody else was basically sort of suspect. Um, and he referred to himself as being of old colonial stock, even though his mother and all four of his grandparents had actually been born in the British Isles. But nonetheless, he felt ethnically the same as the early colonial settlers, and that's what married. That's what mattered. Um, and of course, uh, he was a Southerner. He was the first Southerner elected to the White House uh, since the Civil War. Uh, 
and took a startlingly benign view of slavery. And to the minor extent that the federal government <coughs> has been desegregated uh, since the Civil War, he in effect resegregated it. And there were fewer black people working for the federal government at the end of his eight years in office than there had been at the beginning. Well, I have a, a confession to make um, about um, public confession. About two years ago, a school just two miles from where I'm talking here was Wilson High School. Very good high school, one of the better high schools in the area. And the uh, a new principal, a wonderful young lady, uh, took the reins and was doing a quite remarkably good job. And she in, wanted to change the name from Wilson High School. And my original thought was, this is just another kind of woke thing. This is, oh, you know, can you kind of, <laughs> here we go again. I then spent some time and actually researched Wilson. He is, he was horrible. I mean, I knew he had the, uh, uh, you know, show the birth, birth of nation in the White House. I knew he was of some marginal things. I didn't realize what a complete racist, uh, allowing um, um, lynchings to occur with just no regard whatsoever, uh, allowing uh, his post his post uh, um, postal person was um, you know firing all the black people in the South. I, it was, I, I felt ashamed that my original thought was, you know, kind of get over it when the reality is, as your book tells, this is a part of history that why isn't this more, pro why isn't this more prominent? What, why don't we know about how remarkably bad this man's administration was for our country? Well, as I say, I think most countries paint a sort of glorified picture of their past. And I think the usual picture we get of the American past is that, yes, there were injustices. There were, there were bad things like slavery and later segregation, but they got changed. They got cured. And so it's a sort of onward and upward, steadily getting better uh, kind of path. And uh, that's, uh, you know, all countries do this. I, I've, I've had occasion to study uh, British history, Belgian history for other books that, that I've written. And you see that same pattern. Countries don't come to terms with the difficult parts of their past unless somebody forces them to. When I went to high school in the 1950s, uh, I learned about slavery, but it was mainly important as a cause of the American Civil War. Uh, we didn't read any slave narratives. We didn't really learn what life on a slave plantation was like. When my kids went to high school in the 1980s, they did read slave narratives. Uh, they got much more of a sense of what that was like. And I think that was a direct result of the civil rights movement. Uh, of the 1950s and 60s, that it put those issues on the table. If I'm sure you're from, your listeners are familiar with Colonial Williamsburg, the wonderful reconstruction of uh, old 18th century buildings in Williamsburg, Virginia. If you'd visited Colonial Williamsburg before 1970, you would have seen no indication whatever that half the population of the original Williamsburg we're enslaved, but today it's quite different. Again, it's a reflection, you know, the, the way we look at history has been changed because of things that have happened much closer to the present. Well, I'm very proud every time I go to my mother-in-law's, I drive by Dr. Uh, Dolores Silas High School. And uh -huh. that was what the name was changed changed to. I see, okay. And, um, so I, I was going to suggest they could rename the high school after another Wilson, like uh, William Julius Wilson, the distinguished black sociologist, for example, who studies the causes of urban poverty. But they they actually considered that as as a, a one of the I, options. Uh, the in a way, this is kind of a shock doctrine type of thing. People taking advantage of a crisis. Uh, one of the things that uh, 
was happening around this uh, this time in 1917's Bolshevik re revolution. Lenin was rolling into uh, Russia and reorganizing things, and people were very, very freaked out about this um, and used it as an excuse to almost completely destroy the labor union. Uh, or, or did they destroy the labor union? I think they were successful, weren't they? They, they basically uh, crippled the labor movement. When the Russian Revolution happened in uh, uh, November 1917, it was terrifying to the American establishment for two reasons. One was they feared that it would spread to the United States. I think that was a totally unrealistic uh, fear. There really wasn't much chance of that. But the other reason why it was so upsetting to them was that Lenin and his fellow Bolsheviks had promised to take Russia out of the war. Russia had been fighting on the side of the Allies, not very effectively, this large, creaky empire with a pretty ill-disciplined army. Uh, and then they did take Russia out of the war, and this freed up half a million or so German soldiers on the Eastern Front to be moved to France and Belgium, where they would face the American troops that... Uh, we're going to be coming to Europe and fighting them. So the establishment was deeply upset about this. Um, and this became an additional uh, uh, thing that fueled the crackdown on dissent. And of course, the hysteria against Germany and things German blended very easily into the hysteria against the Russian Revolution because it was the Germans who had transported Lenin and his friends from their exile in Switzerland to Russia for the very reason that they knew that if he took power, he would follow through on his promise to take Russia out of the war. But uh, this certainly, these events certainly increased the uh, violence against the labor movement. The, the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, the country's most militant labor union, uh, was in effect crushed during this, this period. A series of raids in uh, September of 1917 rounded up hundreds of its officials around the country. All 44 of its regional offices were, were raided. Uh, they were put on trial in several mass trials, more than 100 of them in a trial in Chicago, which was and remains the largest civilian criminal trial in American history. The jury deliberated, uh, the, the number of defendants had been reduced to, I think it was 97 by the end of the trial. The jury deliberated for an hour and found everybody guilty on all counts. And the judge passed out uh, a, a, a total of 807 years of prison time and Bill, Big Bill Haywood, the best-known wobbly leader, who had been a uh, saloon card dealer in his youth, uh, wrote to his friend, the journalist John Reed, uh, you know, the big show is over and we lost. The other fellow had the cut, shuffle, and deal. Uh, <laughs> So the deck was stacked against the Wobblies, but even the American Federation of Labor, the moderate wing of the labor movement, lost a million members during this period. Tell me a little bit about the American Protective League, or as we now call it, the Proud Boys. You, you <laughs> wrote a wonderful review of this book. Uh, subsequently, Greg and I both picked it up and read it. Uh, what, what, a, what, a great, uh, what a great find. Uh, and um, draw, draw those connections. Okay. Well, there's always been a strain of vigilante violence running through American history. Uh, I think it comes from the frontier days, and it also comes from the fact that uh, under slavery, uh, Southern plantation owners were always worried about uh, you know, runaway slaves. Right. And there were militia groups of various sorts that were organized to, you know, go and catch slaves who were trying to run away. So there's always been a, a tradition of vigilante violence uh, in this country. And it flourished in this period. The American Protective League had the distinction of not only being 
the largest civilian vigilante group this country uh, has seen, well, except for the Ku Klux Klan, you, if you call them vigilantes, they, they eventually had more members. But the American, many of whom were actually veterans of the American Protective League. The American Protective League was formed uh, in early 1917, just before the U.S. had entered the war, but a lot of people saw the war coming. Uh, its founder was a Chicago advertising man named Albert Briggs. Uh, and he, like the eventually uh, 250,000 men members who joined, uh, was a man who was a little bit beyond military age, but he wanted to do his part in this great struggle the country was about to be engaged in. He got officially chartered by the Justice Department and members of the American Protective League, as I say, a quarter million members scattered throughout the country, uh, they got to wear badges like a, a, a police officer's badge, a sort of silver shield that had their rank, you know, operative, lieutenant, captain, chief, uh, the name American Protective League. And then in the middle, it said auxiliary to the U.S. Department of Justice. All this was on the silver shield that they wore. Uh, they devoted themselves to doing things like what they called slacker raids, where thousands of members of this group would fan out through a city and would ask any young man they saw to produce his draft card or his exemption from the draft or whatever. And if somebody couldn't produce their draft card, uh, they would be placed under citizen's arrest and held you know, in a police station, a warehouse or armory um, for as long as it took for you know, them to get in touch with their family and get somebody to bring the draft card or whatever. Tens of thousands of people were rounded up in these raids, often roughed up in the process. Uh, a very small percentage, around 1%, were actually found to be you know, in violation of the draft. Either they hadn't registered or they'd registered but hadn't gone when they were called and they were shipped off to, to the army. The others were held sometimes for up to several days that it, it took them to get in touch with their families and get the paperwork straightened out and uh, draft, car, draft boards were way behind on their paperwork. So they did this. Um, they harassed other people who were, uh, uh, you know, protesting against the war in one way or another. There's a startlingly violent and zestful description by an American Protective League member of leading a gang that beat up some people having an anti-war demonstration in Grant Park in Chicago. Uh, when the First World War ended, the Justice Department officially dissolved the organization, said your services are no longer needed. But the men, and it was all men, in fact, it was all white men uh, who belonged to this group, were had been having so much fun with their you know, silver badges and so on, they didn't want to give up. And they reformed themselves into other vigilante groups with different names in different cities around the country and devoted themselves to beating up striking workers. And again, there are vivid descriptions of this, um, you know, wading into crowds of strike breakers, stri strikers with blackjacks and uh, beating people up, uh, doing their best to, to break a strike. But that brings me back to uh, Campbell's book here is the, I think one of the most pro profound things I got from that book is that there's possibly great collusion between the FBI and the Proud Boys in, in you know, J January 6th and a lot of the street protest inflaming these protests. And you mentioned a, a fellow named Post who would go into these crowds and beat up strikers and and as it turns out he was an fbi agent himself and that's the, the connections between the proud boys and this american protective league is just remarkable yeah well actually you're mixing it up post with somebody else you're thinking of leo wendell who was the guy okay. in pittsburgh yeah. yeah 
And that's a fascinating story. Um, uh, Leo Wendell uh, was uh, known uh, under a different name. He, he told people his name was Lewis Walsh. He arrived in Pittsburgh. He began fraternizing with local left wingers. He hung out in, in bars where they drank. Uh, he very quickly was elected uh, financial and recording secretary of the local Wobbly branch. He was also active in the city's radical library. He was a supporter of the socialists. Um, and he was violent. At one point uh, during a streetcar driver's strike, he and another fellow proudly beat a strike breaker unconscious barged into a streetcar, which was being driven by a professional strike breaker, beat the man senseless. Uh, the whole time, Leo Wendell was undercover agent number 836 of the Bureau of Investigation, the predecessor of the FBI. It added federal to its name some years later. And he was sending uh, reports every week, several reports a week, about all the people he was meeting, uh, he also sent a very detailed report with the story told very colorfully and, and uh, joyfully about beating this strike breaker unconscious. So obviously the Bureau of Investigation had told him to commit violence that could then be blamed on the Pittsburgh radicals. Uh, periodically, in order to maintain his cover, the government would arrest him. And this was always publicized. They managed to always do it in public and one occasion in front of a big crowd at a socialist meeting. And he'd be hauled off to jail, uh, protesting and struggling and so forth. His comrades never seemed to wonder why he was always released a couple of days later. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, several years later, a labor newspaper blew his cover and exposed his real identity. And then he had a long uh, subsequent career above ground as a private detective and actually an intelligence officer in the Michigan State Troops, which was the predecessor of the Michigan National Guard. Greg, you're an old Pittsburgh uh, yeah. Union radical. Was, was he on your radar? Well, I know he wasn't. In fact, that was uh, quite a revelation to me. But I come to this in an interesting way because uh, when I came to Pittsburgh in 1969, I had a happy occasion to meet a lot of uh, people who were uh, caught in the McCarthyite uh, uh, Red Scare. And I heard their stories and it picked my interest and I studied it more. And uh, when, I, when I read Adam's account of this guy from an earlier period, it, it smacked of what I'd heard and what I'd learned in that later period about Pittsburgh. It was always a a uh, hotbed of labor activism, and of course the FBI was anxious to uh, to get involved. Uh, and 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 subsequently, I I got a chance to take some uh, Freedom of Information Act accounts from different friends and close associates in Pittsburgh and compare notes. And you see this web of engagement and involvement of the FBI uh, in in left wing politics. It's just remarkable. No one would believe it. The way the FBI is glorified today on television and the movies, knowing what I know uh, about their engagement and involvement with these things, with these uh, dating people, with, with uh, uh, planting stories, et cetera, et cetera, it just turns my stomach uh, to think about it. But um, I have a mea culpa too, Pat. I, I, uh, I was a 1969 Woodrow Wilson uh, fellow. <laughs> so I have to apologize to the world for that. I, I've never told anybody that. I just took it and took, took it and ran. And also, I'm proud to say that I'm one block away right now where I live from the Frick Mansion, where ah. Alexander Berkman tried to kill uh, Mr. Frick. And, and <laughs> as, as, as Adam recounts so well, he was the lover of Emma Goldman, which to come full circle, my grandfather, who was an Italian anarchist, named his second daughter, Elma Goldman Vitro. He's an Italian. So this woman <laughs> had to bear that name through her life, Emma Goldman Vitro. But uh, 
but in any case, I think uh, it, it's it's a it's a common story, and and the, the, the meddling in affairs of of working people by the preemptive meddling. You know, they don't want anything to get off the ground. They don't want anything to start. They don't want the fire to begin. Makes them provocateurs. I mean, they get involved and they provoke things. Is that story that Adam told told so well? Uh, I'm proud to say. And I think it's important to to be proud of this. And I have an FBI number. I mean, these F Freedom of Information Act. Uh, some people say, "Well, I was a uh, I went to jail for justice." Well, I've got F two FBI numbers, so I'm very proud of that fact. Well, you just screwed Good up heritage. our you you just screwed up our Google Google algorithm for searching, uh, Greg. I hope you know that. So <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, which actually I just saw a short clip with uh, Chris Hedges uh, talking about that and the censorship of um, you know uh, Tulsi Tulsi Gilbert. What's it? Tulsi Gilbert. The Gilbert, the congresswoman from Hawaii. Yeah, R right. She was yes, she yeah. was hosting She's... she was hosting Tucker Carlson last night and complaining about how the uh, conservative media outlets are being censored by government. Chris Hedges did a, a, a podcast about two or three days ago complaining about how Truth Dig, Alternet, all of these other progressive uh, outlets have remarkably lost their uh, Google hits because of re repression, of uh, uh, the algorithm doing the repression, sort of a, a Hunter Biden a laptop you can't you couldn't find it on Facebook for a, a couple of weeks there. And you talked about that exact uh, media repression uh, with the, the masses and the postmaster general that was also occurring at this time very effectively. Talk, talk, about, talk about how the government was suppressing a dissent. Yeah. Well, all of this came out of the Espionage Act, which was passed some weeks after the U.S. entered the First World War in, 1919, in 1917. And ironically, is the same law that may get Donald Trump in trouble over those classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, one of the things that the Espionage Act uh, allowed then, it's later been amended, uh, was that it gave to the Postmaster General the power to declare a publication unmailable. It couldn't travel through the US mail. Now, this didn't affect mainstream daily newspapers, which were sold on street corners or delivered to people's homes, but weeklies, monthlies, journals of opinion of all kinds, and the great bulk of the country's foreign language press depended on the mail because there was no other way to reach people, no radio, no TV, no internet. Um, and the postmaster general had the power to declare something unmailable. And that power couldn't have landed in worse hands. The postmaster general was one of the many conservative white Southerners that Wilson liked to put in his cabinet, Albert Burleson. He was a former congressman from Texas, uh, deeply reactionary, arch segregationist. His family had actually owned 20 slaves at the time that he was born. And he loved being chief censor. And he went to work very zestfully uh, uh, censoring publications that could go through the mail. He barred more than 400 specific issues of American newspapers and magazines from being mailed, and in effect forced roughly 75 of them to shut down completely. The best known was a magazine called The Masses, which was really the best magazine in the country at the time. It was kind of a precursor to The New Yorker. It published John Reed, Walter Lippmann, uh, Sherwood Anderson, Edna St. Vincent Millay, many other people as well. Um, Burleson hated it because it was on the left, not doctrinaire, but definitely left-leaning. It opposed the First World War. It backed labor rights. and. Uh, from its, he barred its August 1917 issue, which was the last one the magazine ever published. One of the things that got him angry was a cartoon that showed the Liberty Bell crumbling. Uh, ironically, 
Burleson carried out this whole censorship operation, which, by the way, lasted throughout Wilson's uh, second term. Uh, Burleson was bu busily censoring up to the last minute, March 1921, when Wilson finally left office, even though the war had ended two and a half years earlier. Uh, he carried out this whole censorship operation from what was then post office headquarters in Washington, the building that would become 100 years later, the Trump International Hotel, oh my God. where when it's now under a different name, but when it was the Trump International Hotel, you could stay in the Postmaster General suite for $4,000 a night. It's, uh, it's all a big circle. And that's part of the, that's part of the uh, I think you said once this was, this was Trump before Trump. That's right. Uh, you know, you, uh, Trump says lock her up. They were actually locking people up back then. Exactly. Uh, uh, using the uh, hatred of immigrants uh, was prominent. Uh, all immigrants, the F the military keeping track of uh, militant groups by their immigration status, maps of where they were and what they're more likely to be if they're Irish or uh, German. Um, you know, the fake media. No, they they censored the media. They 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 did, literally controlled the media. Um, the hysteria that was created with these uh, groups of vigilantes, uh, you know, running over people in Charlottetown, uh, uh, Charlotte, Adam, Charlottesville. Adam, how do these how do these uh, uh, explosions, these frenzies, as Pat Pat used the term uh, earlier, how do these frenzies end? What makes them end? I mean, what makes them yeah. not go a step further? They they seem to fall short of an absolute takeover by the right. But they, uh, and, and so how do they end? How do you see them as Well, end? I wish I could say it ended because the bad guys repented of their sins. Uh, the country uh, realized it had gone too far and uh, vowed that nothing like this would ever happen again. It didn't exactly happen like that. Uh, I think a couple of things brought the this whole period of repression to an end. One was a predicted upheaval that never happened. The attorney general uh, in Wilson's second term, A. Mitchell Palmer, was the person who presided over a lot of the repression. He staged the notorious Palmer raids, the roundup of large numbers of radicals around the country. Um, and he had his eye on the Democratic nomination for president in 1920 that he would be the law and order candidate as the country's highest law enforcement officer. Uh, he made the mistake of believing his own rhetoric and he predicted repeatedly and openly that on May 1st, 1920, the United States would experience a nationwide communist uprising. Uh, he kept saying this, countries, uh, cities all over the country put their police forces on alert. Uh, in New York City, for example, they called in all three shifts of the police force. One shift was out on the streets. The other two were waiting in station houses throughout the city. J.P. Morgan hired extra guards. They put the National Guard on alert all over the country. They posted extra security at railway stations and ferry terminals and anywhere else where these nefarious communists might strike. Um, the day dawned and nothing happened anywhere. And that both took the wind out of Palmer's presidential campaign and sort of out of the Red Scare generally. And I think the press, the, the daily press in this era, by and large, was really terrible and obediently repeated whatever Palmer or Wilson or other government officials said. The Daily Press realized they'd been had and began to show a little more skepticism. Uh, and that kind of helped bring this process to an end. Uh, then I think the other reason why the repression could come to an end was that it had accomplished its purpose. Uh, the labor movement had been severely crippled and wouldn't really recover until the reforms of the New Deal uh, some 15 years labor, later. Uh, the Socialist Party had been crushed. Uh, its leading figure, Eugene Debs, had been sent to prison for 10 years, um, and many other socialist leaders as well. 
Uh, and, you know, socialism was never as powerful a force in the United States as it was in Western Europe, for example. But I think if the party had continued to thrive through this period um, and continued to be a force in American life, it might have been something that would have pushed the United States in the direction of having the kind of better social safety net and national health care system that they have in Canada, for instance. But the Socialist Party was crushed. Enough of its leaders were in jail, so they could have had, a, if they had all been in the same prison, they could have had a good-sized party convention behind bars. Um, then Wilson left office March uh, uh, 1921. Warren Harding took over. And, you know, he's traditionally remembered as one of our least distinguished presidents. But uh, in some ways, he was pretty sensible. He'd been a newspaper publisher before going into politics. He didn't like censorship. The censorship he immediately brought to a stop. His poster, Mr. General, uh, did not do any censoring. Um, and slowly, under pressure, he began to let uh, the pol political prisoners out of jail and had released most of them, not quite all, most of them by the time he died two years later. He released Eugene Debs from prison and actually invited Debs to stop in and visit him in Washington on Debs's way home. And afterwards, Debs told reporters, you know, I've run for the White House five times, but this is the first time I've actually gotten here. He'd actually made his last run for the White House as socialist candidate for president when in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Uh, so the repression ended, but as I say, having accomplished some of its purposes, which was crippling the progressive forces in this country. You know, I'd like to sort of wrap up with um, your comments and the parallels to what your book, uh, uh, the themes of your book was your review in the New Yorker magazine on Carolyn uh, Eklund's uh, a book, um, it wasn't imperial. It, 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 legacy, it was on legacy of empire. Legacy of empire, and previously she wrote a book specifically about Kenya yep. and the uh, British Empire at the you know, ending of colonialism and the horrible brutality that was occurring. And this is 1950. Yeah. Right? It's not. This isn't. You know. This is 1950. Millions of people killed. Um, you discuss this in your book, King Leopold's Ghost, too, which uh, only recently did the Belgians even start to discuss taking King Leopold statues down. Yeah. How can we have such remarkable um, events in history occur and have them be whitewashed, have them be scrubbed from our collective conscience? Um, any any thoughts about that and about uh, Carolyn's Carolyn Eklund's work? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, you know, every country likes to mythologize their past, and I think, in a way, everybody mythologizes Britain's past because we all love the royal family and we are so familiar with all of their doings. You know, Queen Elizabeth. Charles and Diana and Harry and Meghan and so forth. So we all tend to romanticize Britain's past. And, you know, back in the, the day when I was growing up, you know, there were maps of the world where all the territories that were British colonies or protectorates or members of the Commonwealth or whatever were colored pink on the map. And you know, we tended to assume that these were run in a nicer way than those nasty Belgians who exploited for forced labor in the Congo or the Germans who carried out a genocide in what today is Namibia uh, and so forth. Uh, not to mention depredations wrought by the Ottoman Turks and, and many other people as well. Stalin, but, yeah. Yeah, but Carolyn Elkin's recent book, Legacy of Empire, uh, focuses on some of the things that the British did, and in fairly recently in time, a number of wars that they carried out in the 19, 1950s, um, you know, against rebels against their imperial rule in Malaya, in Kenya, in Cyprus, 
in the 1930s and 40s in Palestine. And it's very, very brutal stuff. Despite the lovely queen, you know, when you finally uh, are with the empire's foot soldiers in the field, uh, they are killing people, torturing people uh, in horrible ways, which most empires find it necessary to do in order to maintain their rule, mm -hmm. uh, either in conquering a territory to begin with, whether it's the European powers going into Africa or Putin going into Ukraine, or maintaining one's rule over people who don't want to be ruled by you. Uh, you know, these cruelties happen in all cases of imperial rule. Greg, you mentioned that before uh, Adam got on about Churchill and... Um... Yeah, there's a book by Tariq Ali on Churchill, which, uh, uh, again, will come as a revelation to all the adoration of Churchill that goes on in our country of uh, just, just how bad he was. I, I recall the, the famine in, I think, the Bengal famine in 1942-43, where he essentially let, let three million Indian people die uh, to keep the war effort going by taking the food that uh, they needed so desperately. But sure, the, the, as, as, as Adam said, the, the mythology that goes around these leaders is just incredible. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, this guy, this guy in 1932 led the attack upon 30,000 American GIs that fought in World War One. that Adam recounts, you know, the bonus marchers there in yeah. D.C. And, and uh, Hoover says, well, you know, surround them and contain them and don't let them march into what he takes it on his own. He says, I never got the order and just goes through there and, 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 and wipes out this uh, this camp where women, children, people are killed. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, the great, the great myth. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I guess we need that. I guess we have a, we have a, a deep, profound desire to have people that we can admire like that. Well, what, what are you working on now? Uh, you know, I've had trouble getting started on a new book. I often get stuck between books and that's why you're seeing a number of book reviews by me. <laughs> uh, you've mentioned several of them. Uh -huh. uh, I have some magazine pieces I'm working on, but I'm not sure what the next book's going to be. Uh, and I, it often takes me a while. The problem is that, uh, you know, to write a book, it usually takes me three or four years. And if you're going to work for, you know, six or eight hours a day on something for three or four years, you better be really fascinated by it. And 99% of the things that fascinate me do so because somebody wrote a very good book about it. Mm -hmm. So how to not duplicate that is always the problem. Well, I cannot recommend enough this book. Uh, like I said, I, I, I listened to your lecture, read the book. Uh, Greg read it and we, we chat periodically. And uh, I think our conversation went something like, oh my God, I couldn't put that thing down. <laughs> that was, oh, yeah. it we just was too. so, I, it made me Not feel just so. the content, the, the writing is extraordinary. The writing just, as, as Pat said, it just draws you in. It's just so well written. I, I think I, I think I write. You speak in the same way you write. Yeah, I I binge the thing in just a couple of days. I just couldn't uh, anyway. Th so there you go. You you did a you did a well job, well played, and I hope there'll be many more. And um, certainly appreciate your time today. And uh, just thank you, thank you for what you're you're doing and for being such a good historian. Good. Well, thank you both. It was really a pleasure being with you. Good. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm.